um, this evening. My name is Darkwa Che Darkwa. I am a non-binary multidisciplinary artist, content creator, and public speaker. And I'm very happy to be here. Um, I will be leading this evening's discussion and I'll be joined by some pretty fab people. Um, I will start by introducing uh, Dan Delamont, um, performer, curator, producer, speaker, and activist specializing in queer heritage. How are you, Dan? How did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, with us, we also have Liv Winter, a playwright and live performer, currently working on an ACE-funded musical about the Greek chorus that forms a direct action group. They work at Hearts and Minds, a youth-led peer support group for young people with mental health that aims to channel radical approaches. Um, outside of this, they were also a part of the Outside Project team, working in the LGBTQI homeless shelter and opening the UK's first LGBTQI plus domestic violence refuge during lockdown. Welcome, Liv. Um, and finally, last but not least, someone that I'm actually very familiar with. We've been to many, many a discussion together um, and had many discussion as well. Shay Shay is a creative digital media student, speaker, and volunteer youth worker. They use their voice and experiences to inspire and educate members of the community who are underrepresented. They are also a part of Giants, Gendered Intelligence, the Gendered Intelligence's activist network of spokespersons, where they help curate campaigns to improve the lives of trans and gender diverse people within their communities. Good evening, everybody. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. I think that I feel like the I because that that wasn't I think that was my third time watching Disclosure as well, and I, every time I'm just like, oh man, so many feelings. Yeah, so so many feelings. Um. I, you know, I think it's actually just the best question to start with. How does that actively actually make you feel? I think we we all come from different parts within the LGBTQ community. And I think it's, um, while we are talking about um, our trans siblings and the trans experience, it's important to make sure that when we're talking about it, we're talking about how we feel when we see the way in which the community is affected so that we can also move forward to affect change. So how did that make you feel? Um, you can start with Shay. Okay, um, yeah, I oh, I think for me, especially when I first watched it, I, I, even now, I hadn't seen being kind of young, I hadn't seen some of the older, like very, very older, uh, you know, representations of, of trans people in movies. And I was, I, I, I couldn't get through the whole of Disclosure at first because it was like a lot. I didn't, I mean, I knew of all the violence that trans people depicted in media that how it was, but I think seeing so many different versions of, of disgust and murder and every negative connotation, I felt very sad and, and, and horrified to be quite honest. It was really nice, I think in midpoints to see parts of like how far we've come you know, and all the history of the of the different trans people that have made such a difference. And I think for me, I was I was happy and I'm kind of proud to, you know, that they paved the way for us in a sense, you know, without them, without all of the things that they they had to do to survive in some instances, we I don't think we would have been at the point we are at now. Obviously there's quite a lot of still to do, but I think it was very thought provoking and it was very like I'm glad it was made I feel like I, I keep telling anyone if you want to have even a bit of knowledge about trans people in the media especially like historically I go watch Disclosure because I think it touches on so many aspects and um, it, it definitely makes me feel a lot I, I, I felt a lot during uh, during watching that again you're on mute Darkwa <laughs> there we go Technology isn't my friend, but I'm trying. Um, Dan, how did that make you feel? Um, well, first of all, the first thing to say is that um, on, on this day, um, it's important to be intersectional, so solidarity and justice to the people of Palestine. Uh, but on that film, um, I've got to be honest with you, Darkwa, um, I was shamefully ignorant. I come from a place of privilege, being a white, cis, 
man. And so a lot of that stuff in that film was completely new to me. And whose fault is that? It's my fault for not educating myself. So I'm really grateful to Poplar Union for bringing us all together uh, this evening and, and, and making me sit down and, and watch that. Uh, the most shocking part for me, uh, well, obviously there were lots, lots of it that were shocking, was um, I've not seen the film about um, Stonewall but to see a white man oh. <laughs> throw the brick is absolute lunacy. I was, my jaw hit the floor when I saw that clip. Uh, I was privileged enough to go to the Stonewall Inn in 2019 for the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. So the Stonewall Uprisings, of course, were so, so important, not just in New York, but um, in this country as well, with the Gay Liberation Front uh, that were born out of the Stonewall Uprisings, which then created pride in this country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they were so, so important historically and so, so important to the heritage of our community that to see that completely reimagined by a film director or a film producer or a writer is outrageous. So that is the, the biggest um, takeaway uh, for me. Um, yeah, I have to admit, um... The first time I watched this, I was also very, very ignorant of so much of the information. I think the first time I watched this, I also was not 100% sure of my gender identity because I do think I moved through life a little bit, just being like, okay, cool, cis black man, bit femme, but not sure. Um, so watching it again um, and making notes and thinking about this conversation is definitely, um, it's definitely conjured some feelings too. Liv, share, share with us. How did you feel? How did it make you feel? Uh, yeah, I've actually been long enough watching it because I thought I would find it quite hard to watch. Mm -hmm. I think that the nature of my work means I don't really need to watch documentary to be exposed to the levels of violence that are still happening. Like working in a shelter and working in a domestic violence refuge for queer and trans people means that the violence is very like apparent as it is as it walks with us as we move through space I think that's something that was interesting me for me about having watched that I think actually uh, uh so I watched Paris is Burning when I was quite young and it, it was a really like seminal transformative thing for me to watch and then maybe when two years ago three years ago when Pose came out I remember going back to visit my mum who had just lost both of her parents and we were binge watching Pose it was a bad choice because there's so much loss in that in that show but also so much like love and family and I just remember like I don't know being 15 and watching Paris is Burning and then being like 25 and watching Pose and these kind of weird correlations but I thought I thought what was interesting about that film is that it wrestles with the idea of visibility in a really interesting way for me like I'm quite turned off by the concept of visibility I mean like I consider myself like an abolitionist and I think when the revolution comes all the billboards and magazines will be burnt to the ground even the ones with queer people on so it's not really like my battle but I thought it was interesting that they the, the people in that film were having those negotiations between how I think capitalism has like wound its way into the queer revolution so deeply that we're we spend a lot of time fighting for visibility instead of justice and and it was nice to hear like even like next level phenomenal celebrities to kind of actually be aware of that and understand the implications of that. I wasn't expecting them to say that. So I do think that was good. I would definitely recommend it to people, but it's a hard watch, I think. Mm. Yeah, def definitely a hard watch. Definitely um, too many moments in which, I think when you say, when you talk about the idea of them wrestling with the idea of, of fighting for visibility and fi fighting for justice, and the fact that capitalism has been so tightly wound into this fight, it's almost, it almost feels, well, I mean, it does feel, uh, I think one of the opening lines actually of Paris is Burning, forgive me, my mind is like jumping all over the place right now, but one of the opening lines of Paris is Burning is Pepe La Beja saying when he was, when they were younger, um, their father told them that they had three things against, well, they had two things against them, that they were black and they were a man. And if they had, if they were gay, there was three things against them and they would find it really hard to make in life. And you really do feel the um, weight of living at an intersection um, that all of these people that we have just heard from, Liver and Cox, Trace Lissette, all of these people have had to um, fight 
because there are so many different factors at play working against them. Um, I, I want to just quickly jump to the statement of the earliest moving imagery, I think this was Laverne Cox that said it in the documentary, and his earliest moving imagery of a uh, moving imagery was actually of a cross-dressing experience. Um, and yet, whenever a cross-dressing experience then resurfaces after, um, after that, it's always ridiculing the person. In, at first, it was making womanhood seem frivol frivolous, and then it actually ridicules the experience that um, tr tr trans people or gender non-conforming people, non-binary people um, have to live with on the daily. I think there's something so dangerous about having an experience consistently ridiculed. I would like to ask this to Shay in uh, the most respectful way possible. How have you experienced any um, instances in which you act actively realize that your life or your experience um, as a gender non-conforming or gender non-binary? Non-binary. Non-binary, sorry, as a non-binary person. Um, how, I've experienced them too, so I'll, I'll be sharing with you. But, um, <laughs> how, <laughs> how, how do you, how have, how has that made you feel? Like how how do you navigate that space in trying to battle against the portrayal of your existence mm. while still trying to justify and affirm your existence? That is a very good question. Sorry. Sorry. I know. I feel like <laughs> I thought we were going to start with like easy questions, and that's just oh, like, no, honey, yeah. I'm a we, we, we yes. go. We go. Oh man, no, it's a good question because even when I, I started started coming to terms with my identity, I, I, I think like what also that was kind of depicted in disclosure is people either don't understand it or they think it's a joke or they don't take you seriously. And, and most of the time it's, it's having to be really comfortable in myself. So I know who I am. So anyone else, society, people that will say whatever they want to say negatively doesn't affect me because I'm at a point in my life where I know who I am and no one else can tell me, you know, better. I can dress however I want and I can be whoever I want and no one can take that away from me. Um, so I think that's how I, in the shortest way possible probably, um, try and over, overcome that, yeah. Because I, I, I did definitely identify with the term gender non-conforming when I was younger, because I was always the, the tomboy in quotation marks. I say that in quotation marks because I didn't have the language to describe um, my identity. But even then, every person older than me would be telling me how I was supposed to dress, how I was supposed to look. Oh, I'm, you know, this person, I should be dressing like this. I should be doing like this. And I always were like, I'm doing my own thing. Um, you know, I understand that to them that is wrong or to them it's not right. But I was very much thinking about, I'm gonna do what makes me feel happy and my, nourishes my soul. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do it anyway, regardless of what other other people have to do with it. Um, I want to say that I com I commend you on that because listening to you talking about it, and you're younger than I am, right? <laughs> so when I think about my experiences in in that same way, there is the I feel like it's 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 so much it's it's weighed down so much more with the denial of myself because mm. to admit to yourself um, who you are and really mm. step into your own like identity is to also step into your power, but step mm. but sometimes you're not ready to do so. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it takes people around you to help bring you out of it. Um, and I did. I don't feel like I had that for quite a while. Um, for I, I'm going to turn the question to Dan, and then I'm going to come to you, Liv. Um, as a cis white man, um, <laughs> I mean, have because I mean, as being members of the queer community, we always have friends who we we have many friends who live through go through different experiences, um, and. How has it been 
for you witnessing the conversation around this, um, around our existence, which is so weird because we're, we're constantly always saying like, no, we don't want people speaking on our existence. However, um, as someone who is an ally to the more marginalized parts of our already marginalized community, how has it been for you learning about all of this, processing it, and then trying to actually put it into action? Well, that's a very difficult question, I think. But one, one thing I try and do is emphasize my queer identity rather than gay identity. By emphasizing the queer element of my identity, I'm hoping that that is a, an act of allyship, that, that, that this is sort of a, a tent in which I am one part of, of which you and Shay and Liv and others are, are, are also part. Because I think that to be queer is to, to be on the margins of society, to be on the periphery, but gloriously so, deliberately so. And it kind of links back to what Liv was saying about this, about a potential critique of the documentary, is it's all about visibility. It's all about kind of being on the front page of a magazine. When actually, if we, if we are kind of more steadfast in the kind of David Hoyle mentality of being in the margins, of being in the periphery and knowing that queer is the politicization of gender and sexual identity rather than this kind of capitalist treadmill of, of pride and, and, and things like that, then I hope that that's a step towards uh, me being an ally. But I mean, I, I'm here with um, open ears and a closed mouth predominantly that if the is I don't want to say to you you know what I am doing to 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 kind of champion you more than listen to what you tell me I need to do to champion you you know as I said before I've never seen that documentary before and uh, perhaps I should have done and that perhaps that's my fault that I'm kind of um complacent in my privilege uh, knowing that you know still if I leave the house right I was potentially going to go for a walk after this talk and I thought well actually is that a safe thing to do I, there is still kind of elements of my identity which which are risky and which make me feel unsafe but I also am very much aware that in comparison to my siblings within the queer community um, I am I am I have privileges don't I and so it's my job to to ultimately listen I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate that I live with a non-binary person who has very much schooled me in the <laughs> in the year that we have lived together and I am grateful for that um, because it, it's not my background it's not my uh, identity and so uh, it's my job to learn about it is that the right answer I mean any answer is the right answer when we're <laughs> making moves towards progress that's what I say. <laughs> um, Liv, I want to talk a little bit more about your critique of, your possible critique of the documentary and the um, fighting for representation um, as, a, as opposed to, or maybe, yes, as opposed to fighting for justice. Uh, can you just speak a little bit more on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it ties into, I, I wrote a kind of essay recently for Huck magazine about the campaign that's been taking place recently to create non-binary as a legal third gender. And I feel like this kind of ties into this as well, this, this idea that creating um, more assimilation might lead to more liberation when we know historically for that to not be true. So for me, for example, campaigning for um, a third legal gender well when we create more laws what we inherently create is more violence for every law there is more people to be made illegal um, and I guess I think about that in terms of visibility every time there is someone platformed we are moving like we are moving the liberation away from the collective into the individual and it is extremely nice for me as well as a little trans anarchist punk I love to see incredible queer people doing amazing shit like I host queer house party I live for the club I get it but when we move it away from collective liberation into individualized successes then then what we're doing actually to me is isn't that productive for the community I would say there's ways in which it can be you know like I'm sure a lot of these people are feeding their money back into really amazing grassroots collectives or I certainly fucking hope they are um, but I would assume some of them are but actually I don't know that someone yeah being on the front of a cover or, or being able to get onto a, a tv show is as liberating as them being able to have housing 
like these these feel these feel like these these feel like under capitalism we've been forced to correlate these things into like one campaign and actually I don't know that they are I don't know if that's an answer to your question no I, th I, th I it's I won't say it's an answer necessarily because this is just a discussion we're, we're just spitting the breeze here mm -hmm. but what I, I will say it's an interesting point because I while I completely hear and understand you I also do feel that there is a neat because if from the very beginning right if from the very beginning every opportunity that is created for people like us to be seen is highlighting a serious issue within our community like like not being able to find housing or not being able to or not being able to pay rent but then at the same time it's coupled with the fact that we're not able to do so because of the fact that we are sex workers or outcasts or this that and the other then there how does it create the mobility to even start fighting for justice because our existences only um are discussed in instances in which we are the cause for the problem that we face when it's actually out wider society that is not wanting to have us um or see us or recognize us um that is the actual cause mm, yeah no i think i think this is the classic back and forth eh? because i guess i agree with what you said but in a way it does also like feed into this point that like the battle to get into these white supremacist and heteronormative spaces is equally like a drain on our resources if you see what i mean like we're either being drained of our resource through our through our need to assimilate to survive or we're being drained of our resources through our desire to survive against the state and like it's a bit of a lose-lose and I think that's why I find myself always leaning towards an abolitionist perspective of like burn it down start again rather than a reformist perspective of like let's try and change the system from inside because I'm like the system's fuck babe it's it's built on rotten ground like you can keep building but you'll keep sinking um which I actually think sounds kind of like pessimistic but it's not I'm a very joyous abolitionist I do believe that like we will see revolution in our lifetimes I absolutely believe it but I don't know that it's within that language but I agree with everything you said I think all these things exist at once and that's why they're so difficult right yeah um yeah definitely it, it, it always does feel a bit like a like you said a chicken and egg situation um, Dan you were nodding so <laughs> much doing that I feel like you've got something to say. Get it off your chest, well it just I completely agree with everything they've said but I, I also I think that the documentary felt very American it felt very glossy uh because it, you've got these individual success stories, which kind of accidentally fell into this pseudo concept of meritocracy, which is a bit like, well, I've succeeded, I've pulled myself up by the bootstraps, I've had a really tough time, and of, co of course they definitely have, um, and, there, and now look at me now, and I just completely agree with Liv that I think that's kind of a problematic uh, narrative to pedal because I'm more interested in the work, not, that, not to say that these people in the, in the documentary aren't working class, but the working class trans narratives. Kind of not having resources in that documentary, how kind of shiny um, everything was. If scalped yes it does it does make sense completely um but i think so i have this thing that i actually read it somewhere um and i i'm gonna get to the point i read it somewhere that the reason that black women when they hug each other they rock is because a lot of the time they're giving each other and themselves simultaneously the comfort that they didn't get they don't often get or are often not afforded in society right now when I say that and then I see this documentary and yes it does feel polished and it does feel very American it does feel very like oh hi look at me like success story the fact of the matter is it's platforming a success story and like I, I can't remember which uh, I can't remember which person it was I can't remember their name but they said the the quote that they said was children cannot be what they cannot see yeah. and if I cannot see any type of representation whatsoever, I can't even begin 
to imagine the possibilities of what it is that I can have. I remember growing up and not having any role models really. And then after a while it was Naomi Campbell and Lucy Liu and Angelina Jolie and don't judge me, Kim Kardashian. Um, and <laughs> the reason that all of these people, all of these women made me, did something for my spirit, my soul, my psyche was because I saw them being anything and everything they wanted to be when they wanted to be it, right? Um, <laughs> before abolition, I was a Kardashian. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so it's, it's, the, it's the, the presentation of possibility, right? Um, a lot of people recently were about this whole life in me. Um, if like if if Mil Nas X didn't do it at this point, someone would have had to do it so that the next time one of us decides to do it, we would be able to do it. And that's not me hitting back at you. I think it's just offering another perspective because I think having spent time in the US and here and having family in the US as well, there there is a way in which things are marketed to make people to energize people, right? Um, and there was quite a focus as well on the Black community, the Black trans community. And that is, again, to energize. Most of the time when I'm trying to comfort friends who are from the same background as me, I come in with the, listen, if I can do it and I'm, I can be this messy girl, you can do it too. So get up and let's do it together. Um, so I think when we look at documentaries like this, while it is good to be critical, we still have to give them their flowers in the sense that it's, it's energizing someone to go and have the conversation because it's energized all of us here to be right now. All of us to be here right now and have this conversation. Um, Shay, I thought I saw you uh, agree. No, it, no it's, just, it's just because I was agreeing so, with so much of what you said, Dark Qua, and every time you said something, I was like, oh my God, yes, exactly, yes, 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 exactly. I, I, I also agree with the point that it did look flashy, but at the same time that, especially if you're younger and you've never even seen some of the media that was shown, or you've never even heard of some of the, the famous names and something, that is a lot of good representation. I didn't even see like a black trans person until I went to a pride only like two years ago. I think to, to see black trans people for me, especially as a black trans person, that, that does, that does uh, the same thing about you, you cannot be what you can't see. I think that even in, in the sense, Google that, and then I was like, Are you serious? Of course, of course, you know, of course, that happened. So, most of the time, I'm looking at uh, more modern uh, movies or, or series or Netflix series that come on that have kind of like black trans people or trans people in general just in there rather than um you know just erased or or or, or not even mentioned you're doing a bit of pointing dark well, I don't know what that means that that's me agreeing like on the <laughs> note <laughs> um let's let's go backwards a little bit um I in the documentary, they mentioned that um, the only gender play that they remember seeing that was successful and chic and quite glam was that of Bugs Bunny. And you know what the funny thing is? I yes. remember that. Episode. Yes, I remember it too. I remember it too. <laughs> Out of all the things that they were naming, the, all of these things from like the 70s, I was like, I don't have a clue. But specifically the Bugs Bunny thing, I was like, Yes, and hairspray. Hairspray and Bugs yeah. Bunny was like the only thing that I got really. Yeah. So I just I wanna I wanna I wanna ask each of you, when was a moment that you felt seen in your coming into yourself at whatever stage of your coming into yourself you were at? 
because I had multiple, I had multiple reckonings. Um, <laughs> and I'm here and every, every day or every couple of days I'm having new realizations like Kylie Jenner in 2016, realizing things. Um, so I want to know, when did you have your first aha moment where you felt like you saw yourself and how did that make you feel? I'm, I'm asking because for everyone on the chat, on, on this, on this um, Zoom, I would like just to share a moment of happiness before we then go back into the depths of why we need more representation. Um, Liv, would you like to start? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, what a great question. It's nice to talk about joy things, isn't it? I feel like uh, the Justified Justin Timberlake album made me want to be a cis man. David Bowie wanted me, made me want to be an alien. Pink made me think I was a lesbian gymnast, which is one thing I know I'm definitely now not. Uh, and I actually agree. I feel like I have these wild gender awakenings all the time. I did a panel recently where I was, I was saying I have this kind of beautiful dream where I might wake up on my 50th birthday and completely perceive everything about my body in an entirely different form. And like, I think a lot about, um, like Mel's and how Mel speaks about gender is this kind of right this idea of transition as instead of it being this full stop it's this kind of ever expanding moment and so whenever I meet a trans person who tells me anything I, I go home and have a light bulb about it because it is just the most beautiful thing and because we have this shared experience but then we also have our completely own beautiful poetry and nuance about everything we feel. And so from the fucking anarchist, non-binary, trans, cross punks, all the way to the most glamorous femme in the ballroom, we have nothing but love to learn. And it's it's so beautiful to see it every day, but it's a bit lame actually that I'm like pink and David Bowie. Cause actually what I mean is like my friends being, being close friends with Travis Alabanza for 10 years taught me a world, a plethora of information, you know? So yeah, I agree with you Dakwa. I feel like it's a every time, every day, every every joyous moment with a trans person you know 100 percent. okay dan when what one moment <laughs> well, since, since liv mentioned pop icons uh i'll i'll go down the pop route as well which is that the first single my mum bought me was jerry halliwell's cover of it's raining men and i used to dance around the living room to that. and i think what's the most ultimate gay moment is that in that song obviously the lyrics go um tall dark strong and lean and mum uh, changed the lyrics to describe dad and whispered it to me which was short fat bald and mean <laughs> so that was like such a moment of solidarity in the house between me and mum you know mum you know reappropriating the lyrics of it's raining men to describe how much she didn't like dad is just such a queer iconic moment from my childhood a, a more uh, contemporary example though and I've mentioned their name already, is when I first went to Bethnal Green Working Men's Club, my favorite space in London, to see the iconic David Hoyle. And uh, I've always felt kind of like a bit of an alien in society, in the world, that I kind of don't really comprehend this kind of, have you, you swiped your nectar card meal deal existence that we, that we live in. Uh, and here I saw David Hoyle, uh, who was gloriously reveling in his status as an outsider. He, he was this kind of Albert Camus figure. And when he said, <laughs> when he said that the royal family, I think it was Kate Middleton who was pregnant at the time. And he said, uh, Kate Middleton should give birth directly into a wood chipper. And I just thought this guy is, <laughs> this guy is a genius. And, uh, and I found my, I found my, my tribe. I found my, uh, I found the people that I, that I love. And I didn't feel, if I, I still felt like an alien, but I felt like I found the mothership, that mothership being Bethel Green Working Men's Club. I love that. Finding your tribe is so important and really just finding um, a sense of family or stability. So, I mean, I love, I love that you said that. I love that you've, you've shared that moment. So for everyone, as the world is opening up, even though we know, don't necessarily know exactly what it is, if you're looking for something, go and find your tribe. Because while we have family, we also have the opportunity to make our families, to choose our families, to cultivate really deep and meaningful connections with people, not only here right in front of us, 
for all around the world through the wonders of social media. But while you're using it, remember to be kind and not an asshole. Um, Shay, please tell me one a, a moment in which you really felt seen. Oh, the I think I, I will do briefly too because I love I love what everyone else said as well. Um, I think going back to me as a a wee a wee child. Um, it was mainly cartoons because cartoons is what I watched as a kid and um, I would have to say Mulan I know that might seem like what what but it's because Mulan in particular you know especially the song Reflection her family was so against you know her being kind of masculine and she had to kind of subscribe to this femininity that she didn't really want to have a part of and it was deemed appropriate for her to get married or like you know be the perfect woman yada 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 and she disses all of that and then goes and saves the country and I just resonated so much with the story and how she was so I would definitely say Mulan even now I still love the kind of message behind that um and then I would also have to say at uh oh trans pride in I think it was 2018 because I think my heart just, just, I, I, I uh, like, like Liv said about how it's, it, you. I don't think there's a beginning and an end with transition. I think it's just, you're always learning stuff and you're always meeting new people and you're always picking up something from a new trans person. But specifically, I think Trans Pride 2018 was the first time in my entire life I had seen a group of black trans masculine people. And they all just, it was like a power move. There was all a big group of them just coming to the cutie pot tent. And they were all just like beautiful. They were all beautiful. And I was just like, what? I, cause I, at, at this point, I, I think I had, I didn't, that, well, media I hadn't seen anyone, but I didn't think we existed. I didn't think, you know, any sort of variation in what this cis binary or, or any type of black person could even be that sort of human. So seeing that and seeing like them being so happy and I think they briefly explained their story and they were all chill and they said, you know, to follow them, connect and whatever. I think that to me was just like, because I think I always feel graciousness when I'm friends with people older than me as well, because they can give me insight because they've learned, you know, so much. I'm, I'm young, but I'm not too young. But seeing, seeing older trans people just being, like, you know, happy and living their best lives gives me hope, even, even as a younger person, because I think so many times when we look at media and stuff, it's all negative or that person died or whatever. And you want to see that actually, no, people do have a happy life regardless you know and I think that to me it was just so pivotal and so important that was lovely <laughs> I I really felt that I really felt that I think um when I think about moments that I feel like I've been seen I don't think that I don't think I've ever really fully felt it you know there's always a whisper of it you know I I grew up in a family that's primarily women. Um, and so I was born and they were like, yeah, we got a boy. And I'm like, jokes on you, I'm non-binary. Um, <laughs> and as I went through life, I never ever felt like I really 100% connected with the cis males in my life. But there was always something about a woman, but when she was particularly annoyed or enraged, um, and that brings me back to this like quiet bubbling rage that Lily Wachowski, was it Wachowski? Yes, Wachowski was speaking about um, in the matrix that like bubbling something under the surface. And I would, I would always, always feel the most seen when I'd hear Naomi Campbell go off on someone or watch um, Kim Kardashian drag Courtney or you know, see Angelina Jolie like graciously, but very cuttingly like duck a question in an interview. There was something in that that spoke to me and it really made me want to get in touch with a part of me that I felt was really repressed. Um, so while I thank you all for sharing your moments of joy, I also want those who are on the line to know your moments of joy don't always come in the most obvious joyous way. And it's completely fine to glean joy sometimes from a darker place because that's something that can help drive and you know help move you forward in um, situations which are or can be particularly uh, triggering. Um, 
the point that was stated that we just need more um, comes to mind at this point because as we've touched on, there are so many, there are so many different ways in which you can exist. Like, I'm, I just want to ask a simple question. Like, what is everyone's favorite book? Not why, just give me your favorite book. Tell me what it is. Shay, you go first. No, no, because that's, <laughs> that's too much. That's too, no, don't, it's like when someone says, what's my favorite animal? And I'm like, aquatic, domestic, forest? What okay. are you talking about? Right, um, so, 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 okay. You need a second? Okay, so Dan, your favorite book. Uh, my favorite book is uh, The Little Prince by okay. Antoine de saint Exbury, because uh, despite being written in the 1940s, it is just so incredibly queer, actually, in kind of its questioning of how society operates, of what it means to be an adult, what it means to be a grown-up, and just provoking why that needs to be the case. It's so deeply powerful. I read it again after being heartbroken, and it just really spoke to me. And I read it again more recently at um, a friend's um, funeral. And again, it just, <laughs> this book is relevant for every time, everything in your life. <laughs> Read it. <laughs> Liv, Liv, your favorite book? Oh, I was just gonna say, so the, my copy of Selfish, obviously, and my uh, copy of Kim, the unofficial biography. <laughs> No, I'm joking. <laughs> I don't think I've got a favourite book, uh, but I am, um, I mean, I'm a playwright. I'm reading and writing all the time. Um, and I drift in and out of love with what I like. I find that one of the most difficult things about like getting more into your community and your politics is you look at like your favourite thing from a year ago and you're like, oh my God, that is so fucked up that I ever liked that. But I will say that like my favourite writer uh, currently is someone called Brecht who writes poetry and plays and he's a, like a really huge influence on my writing but um, I kind of read a lot of like trashy novels I'm not really big into my theory don't tell anyone um, but yeah I don't think I've got a favorite book unfortunately <laughs> all right okay and Shay okay so um, I'm kind of like live I don't feel like I have a favorite book because I go through periods of kind of falling out of interest with things you know maybe I like science fiction maybe I like anime stories or manga sorry or and then graphic novels but I would say the last book that I thoroughly loved and cried multiple times is Gender Explorers just because I had never I'd never read something where it, you you have trans parents trans kids sorry with their parents so candidly just explaining or talking about not even their journey just being kids but also just so open I'd never seen that before ever and I think for me as someone that does not have that as well I just really it, it made me cry because I thought oh it's such a sweet book and I think that's like one of the ones that really I kept I've read this multiple times so I think it's not my favorite book but definitely the last book that made me cry I would say. Okay, perfect. I don't need to answer the question. I, I wanted to illustrate a point. And the point is that despite the fact that we all sit within one community, which is the LGBTQIA plus community, queer community, um, there are so many different lenses through which we see and experience life that despite the fact that we have this common thread, we're different, right? And so the the fact that we the the statement that we just need more, we just need more representation. We need more nuanced characters because because all of these books that we're reading, we, they are they are showing us different iterations of what life can be, right? But for people who live within the trans, gender non-conforming, non-binary, um, got with, within within that within that group within our community, within that community, within our community, that's the better way to say it. Um, there is so little. And therefore there's so little wanting to understand the experience because the experience only exists in fantasy or only exists, like they said, um, in which, which was to do with Jared Leto playing Rayon in Dallas Buyers Club, only exists to teach the dominant force in society um because <laughs> i'm bored of them the, the, the dominant force in society um what they need to do to be better you know i i feel that we we need more so what 
what is the one what is the one kind of character or one kind of experience or one kind of story that you would really like to see platformed more um and you can be you can be super niche super specific because every experience is super niche and super specific which is why we all talk about our experiences which is why we you know share our experiences so that we can educate and encourage understanding so what it, what it, what is what do, what do you want to see next in the more that we need? Um, Dan, I'm going to go to you first. I'll tell you what, I'm going to spin that question around, Dark and tell you what I don't want to see any more of, which is what we saw in that film, which is Eddie Bleeden Redmayne uh, playing the Danish girl. It might have passed your attention. Last week it was announced that Eddie Redmayne will be playing the MC in uh, the revival of Cabaret in the West End. That's my favourite musical. What's he doing playing the MC? We need, <laughs> sorry, we enough of these posh shows, right? We need uh, out queer actors playing queer roles. Give that MC role to the hugely talented and wide pool of queer actors available or let's make uh, a trans let's give that role to a trans actor which would be in keeping with the fluidity of that role so one thing i want to see less of is um trans roles played by cis people or queer roles played by straight people we've kind of grown in that and it's not a question of oh but it's called acting acting is pretending to be something you're not <laughs> we all know that it's that it's not as reductive as that so um i can't remember what your original question was Darko, because i wanted to go on a rant there and i even wrote it down during the film i wrote eddie redmayne no <laughs> um but that's what i don't want to see okay fab um thank you that's like that's still a good good answer to the question um, but I'm going to flip the question the right way around again um, and send it to Liv. Um, what is the next story or experience that you would like to see in the more that we need to see? Yeah, I'm writing, um, I'm writing a play at the moment and it takes place on, uh, it's outside the Houses of the Parliament and there's 100 dead police officers on the ground and there's a big police van and in it there's some police officers who are dying and on the top of it there's two trans femmes and the sun's coming up and they're having a conversation about um, what it's gonna be like when they turn 70 and they're talking about uh, wanting to live on a queer farm together and they're making all these beautiful jokes and they work in this club together and they've come back from the club and we don't really know what the thing is that's happened that means every all these cops are dead but it's just like this moment of them talking about a future that suddenly feels quite possible in light of whatever's happened. Um, and then in the nature of the play, they're talking about this thing called slash and burn farming, which is where when a ground is simply too toxic for any uh, crops to grow, the farmers slash it, slash all of the dead crops, set them on fire and bury them beneath themselves. Um, and this is done in like Scandinavia. And one of the one of the trans firms is talking about this guy who's a farmer she used to fuck and he used to do this. And they're talking about it and have this great story. And the reason I wanted to write that is that like, I wanna write things that are about revolution, but I don't always want them to be painful or I don't always want it to be us that's in pain. And I would like to write stories that do it perhaps embrace and acknowledge violence and destruction and and that side of revolution but i don't want it to be us that is always dying and suffering and so i would like to see more stories that do acknowledge the fact that like the revolution is going to be like probably really intense and horrible but perhaps it doesn't have to be us that is always the person it comes at the cost of so i'd like to see more stories like that more love stories even if they're happening on on the front line you know definitely thank you for that um, and I also look forward to seeing that play. Um, Shay, what is the more that you want to see more? Oh, thank you, Darko, for saying this question because I, it's my favorite question, I think. Um, I just, I, when you ask this question, I think back to the fact me and my friend who's also black and non-binary, we were trying to watch a movie that was like centering a black character that wasn't about trauma. And we were having such a hard time finding something that was black and queer that's not about trauma that's not about slavery that's not about getting shot that's not about police police brutality i think what i desperately need and want is just media film movies that that have a black queer person that's i don't know fighting a dragon or you know having some fantasy adventure with their friends you know like the whole thing isn't about them being 
queer or trans and it's not about oh no they're going to have a terrible life now because of their identity it's about that's just one aspect and let's go fight some dragons or let's go on our adventure or let's go have fun with our friends just something that's so chill that you when you can look back on that you can be like ah I know that character oh yeah they were great oh that was a fun thing I think the the smallest inch I have of that is Garnet from Steven Universe you know but I, w I want more of that, you know, for adults as well. I think that would be amazing and great just to have like something to something else to have, you know, something that isn't depressing or, or weighs you down, something that brings you joy and and is is a nuanced story. Yes, definitely, 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 definitely. I'm fully, fully with you, especially when you mentioned Garnet from Steven Universe. I'm like, yes, because this is a black person who just is existing and doing what they do how they do it and not really i mean they're just living life you know what i mean i think that's what i want to see i just want to see someone who yes i mean listen we all go through trauma so that's fine we're gonna talk about little bits and bobs here and there but i'd like to see a movie of an evenly que keeled sorry an evenly keeled like slightly quirky black non-binary person who's like just like going through life trying to be the best they can a little bit funny a little bit serious definitely a little bit moving potential blockbuster but <laughs> that's that's all that's why is it so hard to imagine an existence for someone that is not that doesn't fit the cookie cutter mold cookie cutter whatever that means um, why is it so hard to imagine an existence in which they can also exist freely? I think it speaks to a discomfort. I was, I, I was recently reading a book, The Power of Not Knowing by Jamie Holt, because I'm very into positive psychology and like trying to make sure that I'm being the most conscious and mindful person that I can be, right? And I was reading this book and it's the, it's talking about um, the fact that we find comfort as human beings in certainty, and we we always want to know exactly what 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 this is at this point in time or whatever. And if we don't if we don't know, our brain usually I think the word was confabulates, where it like picks little bits of information and creates a narrative so you can clearly understand it. Now, just in existing as queer people. We tell, we, we tell the whole idea, the whole concept of this is a set thing. Life can be broken into specific categories. We tell that idea to pack its shit and get gone because our existence, our very existence in this world as queer people, gender non-conforming people, non-binary people, and people who live at multiple intersections is constantly challenging the status quo, but the status quo didn't have to be that way. Um, and so I, what, what, I don't know, I'm doing a rant now myself. Um, basically what I, what I, what I, what I, what I want to say is this one, the more that we need is also being able to be seen to have what everyone else outside of the community sees as a normal life. I don't want, I look, I love Titus Burgess, right? But I don't want the next black, rep the black represent big representation in the media to be another like emotionally stunted slightly manipulative can't keep a job can't keep a relationship person who is mooching off all of their friends because we are more than that i don't want to see a trans woman whether that is a white woman or a black woman or a latinx woman portrayed in such a way that all she has is her body to sell because she has brains. We, we go through so many different experiences that inform us on how to be conscious, emotional, em, em, empath, em, empathic, empathetic, um, compassionate beings. That I just want more of that. I want actual reality. Because we talk about these movies that are like based on true stories, but we're basing it on true stories of only the horrors of our existence and then we perpetuate that by then seeing it and talking about it listen i, I get it we, we 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 love a good emotional movie and a psychological thriller or a drama but when we talk about it it's like oh my god i i oh you need to watch this so on and so forth where we are actively also fueling the creation of trauma porn 
that is only going to trigger us. So as people within the community, um, I ask everyone who is, those who are watching um, and people who are outside of the community who are also watching to look for stories of queer and trans joy as well and share them. You know, when, if, if Buzzfeed posts something about a black trans woman or a Latinx trans woman or a trans woman doing well and, and having graduated college and started a business, like share that too. You know, that's how you're also a good ally because you are actively seeking moments of joy to platform so that we can all see it and benefit from that joy. Because when I eat, all of my friends eat. And sure enough, it's the same for you guys. So make sure as allies, when someone is sending out uh, messages or sharing posts about all of the trauma that these communities are facing, make sure that you are also actively seeking, platforming and sharing the good that comes from that community too. The music that comes from that community too, whether they are signed or not signed or independent or making their music videos on their phone, share that shit. Because if people don't get to see it, they then place limitations upon themselves and stop themselves from being able to exist in the fullness of their queer identity or their transness. And I'm just gonna give everyone a second because I need to drink something. <laughs> mm. I am fully aware that we have gotten to 9.45. Um, <laughs> thank you all for being so great. I just wanna open up to any questions. If there are any questions in the audience at all, please shoot them out to us. I, I'm pretty sure we can keep going for, for, for a couple more minutes, 10 more minutes, I don't know, let's see. <laughs> um, but similarly, actually, I've been asking all of the questions and I feel that this is an opportunity for us to also, okay, so we have five minutes. This is also an opportunity for us to share a little bit more about what we're doing. So let people, can, I would like to go through each, of, each one of, from each one of you, um, what you are doing, one queer person that you would like to share or platform so that other people also know about them. Yeah, I'm putting, I'm keeping you on your toes, honey. That's what Oprah does. That's why she gives good interviews. Um, and I would like to end on that so we can share some queer, trans, non-binary, gender non-conforming fabulousness and joy. Who wants to go first? Roll call. Dan. Shall I kick us off? Shall I kick us off? Yeah. Because everybody is very much invited to the exhibition that I'm curating, which opens this week. It's called Friendship Circles, and it's at a space called Platform Southwark uh, on the Cut by Southwark Station, which is a, a, a meanwhile space. It's earmarked for demolition, but meanwhile, it is used for uh, public benefit. And it is artworks made by my pal, Andrew Lumsden, who was born in 1941 and was one of the original members of the Gay Liberation Front in this country in the 1970s. And it's thanks to people like Andrew that we are able to enjoy so much uh, uh, today. He was one of the founding members of Pride in London in 1972. He was the first out journalist on Fleet Street. It's then that he left mainstream journalism and was the founding editor of Gay News. Gay News was then taken to court on charges of blasphemy in the 1970s after it published a poem about um, a Roman soldier uh, wanting to have sex with the crucified body of Jesus. Um, and so he has lived a rad life. And now at the age of 80, he is not stopping living a rad life. He continues to be an activist. He continues to be an artist. He continues to be a writer and a speaker and it is my privilege to showcase um, his artwork which is of friends and friendships and allies and you might notice a slight um, influence of um, the psychedelic hobbies that he was uh, that he partook in in the in the uh, in the 1970s so like um, great um, portraits of people but with these amazing sort of colorful landscapes behind them that exhibition is free and it's on a platform subject from the 21st to the 29th of May check it out Thank you so much, Liv. Yeah, I feel like um, I've been repping the same crowd for a while now, but I would say consistently the artists who have huge influence on me would be Travis Alabanza, uh, Zana, which is like X-A-N-A, -A, is one of my ultimate absolute 
heroes um, who I am blessed to ever be around. I would say that for me, a big part of Queerness is like being involved in organizing. There's lots of campaigning at the moment happening, particularly around um, the Kill the Bill kind of movement, which will have a really huge detrimental effect on the queer community and particularly queer nightlife. So if you haven't got your eyes around that, then have a look. Sisters on Cut are posting really good information that you can keep on top of. Um, and I think that's it from me. Oh, and if you ever want to, I don't know, if someone leaves you a million pounds in your will, then give loads of your money to the outside project and give me a fiver. <laughs> Thank you sorry, so much. To, sorry, just to say to that, that all profits from the exhibition Friendship Circles goes to the outside project, FYI. <laughs> fab, fab. We've got a little cross-pollination going. We love it. Um, Shay? Man, oh, sorry, I was still rambling from, from that. Are you, are you supposed to just choose one person? Because that's hard for me to, uh, to, to do. Um, oh. You gonna say something, Delgo? No, I was just gonna say, I mean, okay, listen, I'm gonna give you two, just go for two. And then everyone can go to Shay's Instagram and see the rest of them on their story. How's um, that? <laughs> I mean, I actually, I do have a load of people you can follow just because I think they're amazing people. Um, I would say because I'm going to be helping out with um, him, um, with his work as well, uh, TMB Connect, Trans and Non-Binary Connect. It's uh, Nate Ethan Watson, who's a mixed race trans man, uh, started the organisation to help trans and non-binary people in Wolverhampton and he's going to expand to London. Um, you know, just transition, feel safe, have conversations. There are workshops currently going on. And, you know, he also, I think he got a, uh, some sort of deal with filler so he can send, you know, young trans people clothing as well, because usually it's kind of hard to find clothing that you want to wear when you're, you know, transitioning or you don't feel comfortable wearing certain things or going into certain places because they think you're a certain type of person. Um, and, oh, Oh, uh, I um, I would have to, I'm going to say briefly Tanya Compass as well, just because uh, she's someone I've really looked up to um, in youth work because I do some youth work for gender intelligence as well. And um, anytime I've had asked for advice or kind of needed some sort of, you know, um, conversation going on. She's always been, you know, a voice of the community and like helping. She really loves to help. Like, I think I'm not I, younger people. I'm like, I'm not that young, but like younger, the under 25. So that's what we're going to do. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's that's all I have to say. Otherwise, I'll go on a ramble because I like Doug was said, I have on my Instagram page and like at least 20 people that you could go follow that do amazing, incredible work all over the community. I think my problem is I always platform other people and I don't know how to platform myself, which I've realized. Well, honey, you're doing it right now and we're platforming <laughs> you. So my person that you should definitely follow um, and share and just listen to them speak is actually Shay. Um, I met Shay. Oh, at, I met Shay, at, I think, was it SOAS? Was yes. It was I still remember um, your talk. And I, I remember our very first meeting, I remember us speaking and I remember having seen you continue to come into yourself, speak about your experiences, share experiences, and also continually platform other people's experiences as well. And like I, I said earlier, and listen, I have no issue with you being younger, don't worry. <laughs> but um, I definitely do commend you on just really stepping into your power. Um, it's really beautiful to see and really, really stunning. Oh, so okay. um, I think Thank with so that, much. I'm gonna bring the evening to a close. Um, thank you so much to all of you for being here. Thank you for sitting with us, sitting in our feelings, sharing your feelings and creating a space in which we can discuss issues that pertain to our community openly, honestly, and with passion. And hopefully this has lit a fire in everyone to go and do more good in the world. Um, remember that we can't say we're going forward if some of us are left behind. So make sure that you are bringing everyone with you. 
it's not all the time that you have to do it, but have your community in mind and have those who are in your community who live at intersections that make it harder to get to the starting point for this race, make sure that you are checking in with them, not only as the world opens up, but just on the regs because we all need someone, we all need to speak, we all need to share, we all need to feel recognized and seen. And when you are erased from the media, it's even more important that those around you who are in your community, who state that they're supporting you, show you that you've seen as well. Thank you very much and have a great night. Yes, yeah, stop. Well. <laughs>